Let me invite you to turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. If you have been reading through the Bible with us this year as we've come to Chronicles, I must confess Chronicles to me is one of the most puzzling books of the Bible because as we read it, you can't help but ask, have we already read this before? We've been, why, what's the need for the repetition? Why the redundancy? We've already covered this stuff. But what we need to look at at the book of Chronicles, the lens by which we need to view it is to understand that Chronicles is both theology and history. Chronicles is the chronicler writing history from a theological perspective. He is writing after the exile as the Israelites are returning to Jerusalem as the people of God are asking themselves, what do God's promises mean for us? And so he focuses on God's promise through David and through David's dynasty, and, and he shows the, the successes and then the failures of the subsequent kings. And he is asking all of us to examine ourselves as we read this to basically inquire of ourselves, are we living trusting in God's promise? Are we living being faithful to what God has told us he is going to do? And what's interesting is as we read through the book of Chronicles, we notice that there are some major events that seem left out. There is no mention of Goliath. There's no mention of David's sin with Bathsheba. Matter of fact, the only real failure of David that the book of Chronicles records is here in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Now, in order to understand what's so wrong with what David does here, we need to look and, and, and see the context of it because what happens is, in, in, we talked about it a few weeks ago, now, that, that as David brought the Ark of the Covenant there into Jerusalem, as he brought the Ark there, he says, I want to build a house. I want to build a permanent structure for God's Ark. I want to build something permanent. I've got a palace. I've got these houses. And God's Ark is just sitting under a tent. And so there in First Chronicles chapter 17, David says, I'm going to do this. But God says, no, you're not. This is not something to be of your initiative, David. This isn't something you just take on yourself to do. This is something that I instruct you to do, and you're not going to do it. You're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. And God says that it was going to be through Solomon, the, the son of David, that he would use Solomon, who would later be described as a man of rest, to build this temple. Now, God says before the temple needs to be built... He says, I am going to destroy all of your enemies. And so the next several chapters, chapters 18, 19, and 20, are just a bunch of military conquests as David is going and he's defeating the Philistines and the Moabites and the Amorites and these ites and those ites and all the ites. And it's just a whole bunch of, of military conquests. And so David is standing victorious at the beginning of chapter 21. But there is one enemy that David has not conquered. There is one adversary that David stands helpless against. And though he has taken this ragtag bunch of farmers and shepherds and led the Israelites to great military victories, David stands helpless against Satan. And the promise that God made was, David, I will subdue your enemies. I will defeat them. And David has forgotten that. David has forgotten that it was God that gave him the victory. It was God who was at work all along. And now David stands arrogant, David stands proud, and David stands weak and helpless. And I want us to look here in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 as we see David succumbing to his greatest enemy. In verse 1 it says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, Go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring me a report that I may know their number. But Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not, my lord the king, all of them my lord's servants? Why then should my lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? But the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. And in Judah, 470,000 who drew the, th the sword. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in numbering. For the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. But God was displeased with this thing and he struck Israel. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing. But now please take away the iniquity of your servant for I have acted very foolishly. And the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Choose what you will, either three years of famine or three months of devastation by your foes while the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord. Pestilence on the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now decide what answer, and I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw, and he relented from the calamity. And he said to the angel who was working destruction, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, within, and in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and his elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who gave the command to number the people? Is it not I who sinned and done great evil? But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house. But do not let your plague be on your people. Now the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan was threshing wheat, and he turned and saw the angel, and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. And David came to Ornan. And Ornan looked and saw David and went out from his threshing floor and paid homage to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Give me the side on the threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. Give it to me at its full price that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Ornan said to David, Take it and let my lord the king do what seems good to him. See, I give the oxen for burnt offerings and the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for a grain offering. I give it all. But David said to Ornan, no, but I will buy them for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David paid Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the site. And David built there an altar to the Lord and presented burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord, and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offering. Then the Lord commanded the angel, and he put his sword back into his sheath. At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness and the altar burnt of, on the altar of burnt offering, were at that time in the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. And then David said, Here shall be the house of the Lord God, and here the altar of burnt offering for Israel. David has defeated all the armies of men. David stands victorious. But here is David. And David gives in to the temptation of Satan. I mean, if we look throughout David's life, this sin, this sin of numbering the people of taking a census seems rather benign. It is nowhere near as bad as committing adultery and having a husband killed. It's nowhere near as bad as his lapses as a father or as a husband. He took a census and yet it was this census that led to the death of 70,000 people. 
What's going on here? Again, we have to look at this in the, the, the context of what God has said. God says, I will defeat your enemies. And David needs to see God at work here. And there's several lessons we learn as we see God defeating this for us. The first lesson we need to learn is that Satan seeks to attack God's people. Listen, we need to realize that Satan is always seeking to attack. One of the greatest tricks of Satan, I believe, is that he has made himself seem harmless and almost laughable. We depict Satan with what? Little horns and a tail and a pitchfork. He looks almost silly. That's not somebody to be afraid of. That's not somebody to be terrified by. That's somebody to just kind of laugh at and move on. Satan has caused us to, to, to be convinced that he's rather harmless. But the Bible describes Satan not as, as, as harmless. He doesn't describe Satan just as somebody who causes a little bit of mischief. He is described as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He does not merely want to hurt us. He wants to destroy us and he wants to kill us. Satan will do anything he can to stand in opposition to what God is seeking to do. And the armies of men could do nothing, but Satan, because of his temptation of David, was able to take out 70,000 men. We need to be on guard. It's important that we never let our guard down. Look, when does Satan strike? Satan strikes at a time of prosperity. Satan strikes when things are going well. He strikes when, when, when God is at work, when, when the armies are being defeated, when people are feeling like they can let their guard down. It's so amazing that, that so often in life, when things are bad, we run to God because we know how needy of God we are. But when things are well, I feel like that is when we are at our most vulnerable. Because we don't understand our dependence on God. We don't see our utter need for Him. And so Satan comes when David's guard is down, when David is feeling a little boastful of himself. And Satan tempts him. And I want you to see what the temptation, right? Satan just says, take a census. Take a census of these fighting men. But in doing so, that seems so small, that seems rather insignificant, but the sin that, that, that t- the, the, the act covers, the sin that it reveals, is far deeper and far more dangerous than we realize at first sight. See, Satan tempts us to trust in the seen over the unseen. Israel, throughout their entire history, kind of had the small man's complex. Right? They were the smallest nation. They didn't have the wealth of the Babylonians, they didn't have the intellect of the Egyptians, and they didn't have the, the, the might of the Philistines and, and the Amorites and, and, and all these other nations, they didn't have all the stuff of the Persians. And so their whole existence, Israel realizes that they are smaller than everybody around them, they are more vulnerable to all these armies around them, and they don't know what to do. And so now... They need to number their fighting men. They need to see how many fighting men that there are because David has been leading them on these military conquests and doesn't say perhaps he's wanting to lead on another. Perhaps he's just wanting to know because he wants to be ready to be on guard. But what he is doing is he is trusting in numbers. He is trusting in what he can see instead of trusting in the one who promised him security that he cannot see. God said... I'm going to subdue your enemies. That ought to have settled it for David. I don't need to know how many fighting men there are. I don't need to know their level of skill. God said, I will subdue your enemies. That's all David should need to know. But David wants to see. David wants verifiable proof. If we're under attack or if we want to attack, here's how many guys we have at our disposal. We fall prey to the same things. God says... That all things work together for good, but what do we do? We want to know how, and we want to know why. And God, explain this to me. It doesn't make any sense to me. God, if you'll just show me, then I'll trust in you. 
we, we hear God say, I'll never leave you or forsake you, but God, I'm looking at my bank account. I'm looking at this doctor's report. It doesn't look like you're not forsaking me. It looks like you've abandoned me, God. It looks like you've left me, God. Here's what I see. Here's the evidence. It doesn't matter what you have said. See, these, these attacks of causing us to try and trust in what we can see instead of what we cannot, instead of trusting in the Word of God, it is Satan's way of corroding our faith. We have to admit God works in ways we do not and cannot see most of the time. God does things that are unknown to us. God does things that, that are unrecognizable in the moment. And, and we don't see all of this. We can't recognize all of this. And when we can't see, all we have is God's word. But that is not a statement of poverty. That is not a statement that, well, I don't have anything else but God's word to trust in. There ought to be no more convictional statement. There, not, there ought not be more, any more statement that, that would cause us to well up with greater faith and strength and encouragement than to know all we have is all we need, and that is the word of God. God has said it. It is going to happen. If God has promised us, why do we worry about it? I may not see what God is doing. I may not know how his plan is going to unravel. I may not know how he's going to provide or what he's going to do along the way. But if God has given me his word, there is nothing more sure in all of the world. I don't need to see legislation come from the government to feel like God's going to protect me. I don't need to see events happen so that I feel protected. I don't need to see a bank statement to know that God is going to accomplish through me what He purposes and pleases to accomplish through me. God's Word is enough for me. And David stopped trusting in what God had promised. And David wanted to see what he thought was empirical proof. And he is turning away from it. So often we're plagued by this insecurity of not knowing. We don't know. We want to know. We want to see. Listen, we don't have to because God does. We serve a God whose ways are higher than our ways. And we trust in Him and how He works and when He works. And we, we should not give in to these temptations to trust in the seen over the unseen. But the second thing that Satan tempts us to do is to rely on our own opinion. As David says, let's have a census. You see, here it comes, who at that point was his trusted advisor, Joab. And Joab goes, ah, this isn't a good idea, David. I don't want to do this. This is, this is not good. This is abhorrent to me. This is sinful. Don't you be bringing everybody else into your insecurity. Don't you be trying to lump us all in with your pride. Joab says we ought not do this. But I like how the writer of Chronicles puts it. The word of the Lord prevailed against the word of Joab. You know what that means? David said, you got to do what I say. David toned out, he tuned out everybody else. And one of the ways I think that Satan attacks us is to isolate us so that the only opinion we listen to is our own. See, all of us, the way we view the world, the way we look at things, the way we think about things, it has a very self-centered bent. This is how I would do it. This is what I think. This is how it affects me. But God has brought us in community. God has put people in our lives so that uh, we get... That advice. Right? Proverbs says that there is wisdom in the counsel of many. We need other people's opinions. We need God's word. One of the most dangerous things we do is when we start tuning it out. When people say, I mean, one of the, the most destructive things that a Christian can ever say is, well, I know what the Bible says, but. What, what, what we say when we say, I know what the Bible says, but. We're saying, I don't care about God. I know better than he does. And you go, oh, I, no, I would never mean to say that. But that's, that is, in essence, what we're saying. When we tune out the advice of others, when we don't listen to what others have to say, what we are doing is we are, are 
putting all of our bets on, on our opinions and how we think, and we're not listening. We are, are assuming that we know to know. Right? This is why I'm so thankful that, that you know, Sarah and I, as we raise Henry, we're doing it together because there are times where dad's opinion and mom's opinion are very different, and I need to hear mom's opinion. I need to hear Sarah's mercy speaking over dad's wrath. I couldn't do it on my own. I I don't want to sound... She couldn't do it on her own. God has given us each other to balance each other out in this this raising of a life, this shaping of a young man. God has brought us together as a church to say, we need one another. We need to think together. We need to work together. We need to reflect together on what God's Word says And when we start shutting ourselves off, well, this is what I think, and I don't care what anybody else thinks, that is a dangerous thing for us. And if Satan can get us to turn inward where it's just about my opinion and just about what I think, then we are are running headlong into danger. But third, Satan tempts us to presume that which belongs to God belongs to us. I think this is probably the greatest sin. See what David does is David says, let's number the men. Let's figure out how many men there are. But Joab reminds him, these are not your servants. These are not your people. David doesn't want to hear it. Because he... One of the greatest temptations, one of the greatest lies we believe is that our stuff is really our stuff. But it's not. We, when we start to think we have ownership of it instead of stewardship of it, we start doing what we want to with it. We use it towards our own ends. You see what David is doing here. David is commanding the Lord's armies. David is commanding the Lord's people. But David is trying to use what belongs to God to accomplish his own ambitions. And when, when I start to think my money is my money, when I start to think my house is my house, when I start to think my family is my family, I'm going to use them to accomplish what I want from them. I'm going to use them as a means to the ends that I want. But those things do not belong to me. Those things are gifted to me to be a steward of for God. Henry is not my son through whom I channel my dreams and ambitions and my goals. He is God's. And it is my job as his father to help mold him into the man God has created him to be and do the things God has called him to do. My stuff, my car, my clothes, everything that, that is, I think is mine is really God's. Your business, it is not your business. It is not yours. It is God's. God has given you that. God has gifted you for that, for you to use for His glory, for you to accomplish His purposes with. And when we start to think of our stuff as ours and we start to try and use it for our own ends, it's disobedience. Let me just remind us, right, right now, I, I, I kind of gave an update on Wednesday night. Right now, we're just in the process of figuring out what's going to happen. And this whole rebuilding is going to be a long process. We're, we're working with insurance. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of, of stuff to do. But let me just remind us at the very outset, this is not our church's building. This is God's building. And whatever we do moving forward is going to be what God wills. That's our goal. Our goal is not to try and figure out what all of us want. Our goal is not to try and figure out what a staff wants. Our goal is trying to figure out what God wants us to do with it. And so many churches, Satan attacks the church by causing the church to think that it's their church. It is not your church. You did not die for it. Christ did. It's His. He purchased it with His own blood. 
And so as we move forward through this, and I will be the first to tell you, I am in way over my head in all of this. Thank the Lord for Chuck and Paula and, and, and all those who have been helping because I'm just, numbers aren't my thing. <laughs> And, and I am I'm in a daze. But as we move forward, whatever that means, whatever that looks like, it is our job, it is our goal, it is our burden, it is our mission to discern what God wants and to see that come to, to pass. And when we start to try and think of things as ours, we, we fall into this temptation of sin just like David did. And Satan will attack us, attack us with all these temptations. Satan will, will tempt us. Satan will try and cause us to stumble. Satan will try and derail us from doing what God is, 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 has called us to do. And we need to be on guard against that. And so we need to first realize that Satan's desire, Satan's goal, Satan's mission is to attack us. But secondly, we need to realize that sin is destructive to our lives. Not only do we minimize Satan, we minimize sin. Sin is just bad decisions. Sin is just unwise actions. You know, sin is destructive. It's amazing that we come to the Bible, and especially as we read through the Old Testament, we come across these sins and we think, man, that's really harsh that God would do all that stuff. Man, that's really awful that God would act in these ways. God acts in justice against sin. God acts in, he acts justly towards sin. God acts harshly towards sin because sin is awful. I was just talking when we were in Kentucky uh, a couple weeks ago. I was talking with a pastor and, and he had followed. He pastored a very large church in Kentucky. At that time it was the largest Baptist church in Kentucky. And the pastor he followed uh, was caught. He had been having an affair for seven years. And so this, this man came, and, and Kevin came to pastor the church, and he, he wanted to have a conversation with the old pastor, and he found out that he worked at a grocery store. So he went into the grocery store, and he said, where can I find so-and-so? And they said, aisle seven. And here he went, and he assumed that the guy was the manager or whatever. No, here was an ex-pastor in his 60s on his knees putting cans on the shelf as a stock boy. And he said, you know, that image has always stuck with me because I said, that's what sin does. It destroys lives. It ruins us. Sin is not something to play with. Sin is not something to trifle with. Sin is not something to dabble in. The goal of life is not to see how close we can get to sin without sinning because sin is destructive. And here is David with, with again, this, this seemingly innocuous action of just taking a census. But 70,000 people died. David, he, he was compromised as king. This would affect him. This is a sin so great that the writer of Chronicles, who, who so wants to lift David up as a hero, says this is the event that we have to record. Sin is destructive to our lives but one of the things that this, this shows us is not only our lives, but other people are affected by our sin. And we can't forget this. Other people are affected by our sin. David sins, 70,000 people die. You think, well, my goodness, that sure doesn't seem very fair. They're not the ones who sinned. First of all, they did. They, they were not innocent. They went along with this, and, and this is not an isolated incident. We can't forget that. But secondly, look at what God is doing. David's object of pride is how many people there are. And so what does God do? God attacks that object of pride. See, when we sin, sin is so bad. Sin does not just affect us. It affects the people around us. So, uh, I've just got a bad temper. It's... Not a big deal. Ask your wife and kids if it's a big deal that you have a temper. But people who have the sins, who, who get, get caught up in, in addiction or, or of any kind, alcohol, drugs, gambling, whatever it may be, ask their families. I mean, I've talked with, with widows. I talked with a woman one time. She said the worst day of her life was when her husband won $25,000 at a casino. 
because he was convinced he could do it again. And he ended up gambling and got their family in $250,000 of debt and killed himself. His sin affected his wife and his kids. Your greed affects your family, your, your anger, your impatience. It affects others around you. We never sin in isolation. Sin always has its ripple effects. And we need to see how destructive sin is in that it doesn't just affect us, it affects others around us. We also need to realize, though, that even though Satan tempted David, David was responsible for his own sin. You see, the Bible takes away the Satan made me do it thing. Satan cannot make you do anything. Satan can tempt you, and you can give in to temptation, but he cannot make you do anything. You notice, at the beginning of the chapter, it tells us Satan incites David to do this, but Satan is not the one who is punished here. David is the one who is punished. Every sin we commit is a sin of our own choosing. It is a sin of, that, that we are guilty for. We need to try and, and get away from this idea of of innocence. Right? We are a culture that so likes to shift blame and absolve ourselves of, of responsibility, but the Bible is very plain that there is no sin of which we are innocent. If you sin, it's because you chose to. It's, even if you say, well, it was an accident, it's because you weren't intentional about doing the right thing. And David, he gives in to Satan's temptation, but David is held responsible for his own sin. We also need to see that repentance does not negate punishment. David apologizes. David acknowledges his sin. But David still has to face punishment for his sin. David still has to face justice for his sin. You cannot think that if you sin, there aren't consequences for your sin as soon as you say, I'm sorry. And we need to distinguish sometimes... That, that sometimes there is punishment for our sin. Sometimes sin just brings with it its own consequences. You know, I, I've sat with guys and they've cheated on their wives and their wives left them and they say, why would God do this to me? God didn't do that to you. Well, I, but I, I said I was sorry. Shouldn't she want to come back to me? Listen, you broke the covenant. You can't then force on her what that means for her. When we sin, we stand deserving of punishment. And even when we repent, even when we truly acknowledge our sin, even when we truly turn from our sin, and, then it seems like David's repentance here was genuine. That does not mean that punishment just goes away. If sin is so awful, sin has to be punished. And sin's destructive to our lives. But the third lesson we see is that God has provided what is necessary for us to defeat sin. God says, I'm going to subdue your enemies. And here is David. David is attacked by Satan. David gives into the temptation to sin. The sin destroys his life. The sin costs the lives of 70,000 Israelites. What is he to do? Now God sends help. God sends an angel. And I want us to see that God has provided what is necessary for us to fight against sin. See, God defeats sin through judgment. Why does God judge sin? Why does God punish sin? God does it so we stop sinning. As a dad, Henry likes to go, Hey, Dad, if, if I say I'm sorry, do I not have to do this? Hey, Dad. And I, and I have to tell him, Hey, he's, you know, he's smart. He wants to get out of punishment. I don't blame him. But I said, buddy, the only way you're going to stop doing this is if you associate it with negative consequences sometime. Like you need to see that bad things happen when you do this, that it's not a pleasant thing. And so sometimes I have to punish him. And so, so it is with God that God judges our sin to keep us from sinning. You'll notice God gives David three choices. You can either have a famine, you can, you can face your enemies, or you can face the sword of the Lord. 
And David says, I choose God because God is merciful. I don't mind. I can trust myself to the hands of God. I don't want to trust myself to the hands of men. What's David saying? David is saying that even God's justice is an act of mercy. That even when God acts what we might consider harsh or do things that, that we may not want and may not seem in the moment to be pleasant to us, David is saying, I would rather trust myself to God than trust myself to men because God is merciful and God is good. And the reason God sends judgment into our lives is not to make us miserable. It's not to make us sad. It is to spur us on to righteousness. The goal of God's judgment is that we stop sinning. So often we treat God's judgment like he just sends it into our life to make us miserable or to make things difficult for us. But that's not the case. When God sends judgment into our life, it's so we don't sin. It's so that, that we... We see how horrible our action is. You see, we don't really understand how bad sin is. Sin is cosmic treason. Sin is me saying to the God of the universe, the one who created me and the one who gave me life, I don't trust you. I don't love you. I don't want anything to do with you. That's what sin is. Sin is awful and sin is horrendous and you and I cannot see sin through God's eyes. And we need to stop focusing on how bad we think God's judgment is and we need to start focusing on how bad our sin actually is. We say, well, God's not fair. Michael, I mean, killing all these people, doing all this stuff. Listen, here's the reality is every single one of these people were a sinner and none of us deserve to live. We sin, we forfeit our life. That's what the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. God created us, God gave us life. I said to God, I don't want to do what you want me to do with my life. I do not deserve to live. That is what justice looks like. And God is gracious. God's goal is not for us to just get wiped out. God's goal is for us to be righteous. God's goal is for us to have a relationship with Him. And God sends judgment into our life to push us towards righteousness. But not only does God defeat sin through judgment, let me just say this. If my goal in life is to honor God, then whatever helps me do that is a good thing. If my goal in life is to please Him and to honor Him and to glorify Him, then I can say, as David says in, in Psalm 51, I rejoice in the bones that you have broken. See, so often we look at punishment and what we think about judgment really reflects what we think about God. When we say judgment is too harsh or this is too bad or I don't like this, what we're doing is we're betraying an attitude that says God's here for me. God's to make my life better. God's to clean up my messes. Why is he doing this? Why would he send judgment into my life? That makes my life more difficult. But if I view God as good and holy and worthy of all my praise and all of my life, if I, seek to, if I desire to give him all that I am and all that I have, then I say anything that brings me closer to him, anything that makes me more like his character is a good thing no matter how painful it may be. But God doesn't just defeat sin through judgment. He defeats sin through mercy. Because this angel comes and this angel tells David to build an altar. God says it's enough. No more. And what we see in this passage, David says, I want... To, to trust myself to God because God is merciful. Listen, God's goal is not to crush us. God's goal is not to smite us. God's goal is not to make our lives miserable. God's goal is for us to love Him. And one of the ways that God defeats sin in my life is by judging sin in my life and purging me of that sin. But that alone will not achieve the goal. Because if all I do is, is do the, the right things because I'm afraid God's going to get me if I don't, that's not righteousness. That's not fear, the, the way the Bible speaks of fear of the Lord. 
So God defeats sin through judgment, but God also defeats sin through mercy. And he says to David, build an altar here. Here's where you can offer a sacrifice. Here is where if you provide a sacrifice, my judgment will stop. I will relent. And God tells David to build an altar where justice and mercy meet. David said, I want to build a temple. And God says, no, 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 this isn't your initiative. This is my initiative. And now God is telling David, here's where you're going to build the temple. Here, where the angel of the Lord is coming and he is bringing judgment, he is bringing justice, he is bringing punishment. And here, where the angel of the Lord is coming and he is speaking of mercy. Where those two meet, where justice and mercy meet, God says, I want you to build an altar and here's where you're going to build the temple. And if you think about it, what the temple was, was the temple was a reenactment. It was a constant reenactment of justice and mercy meeting. It was the people bringing their sacrifices saying, I deserve God's judgment. I deserve punishment. I deserve to die for my sin. But God is merciful. I deserve this eternal separation, but God has provided a sacrifice. And here in in this meeting, in this marriage of justice and mercy, God says, this is what you're going to use to fight sin. Here you're going to worship. And worship is how we continually fight sin in our lives. What is the means that God provides to fight sin? What is it that God gives us so that we fight against sin and against temptation and against Satan? What is the weapon that God gives us? It is worship. David has said, here, here's where you build the altar. Here's where you worship. And the way you fight against this pride and the way you fight against this insecurity, the way you fight against this doubt, the way you fight against this animosity, the way you do that is to worship me. And here's where the temple would be built as the people would gather and they would daily and they would regularly worship God, praising him for, for all that he does. Worship is warfare. We have this, this notion of worship as passive or, or, or as light. We view it as, 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 as trite. When we worship, we are engaging in warfare. We are declaring who God is and what God has done. We are, are focusing on God's greatness. And we are saying we will not give in to these temptations. As we worship, we are turning our hearts towards our Creator. As we worship, we are reflecting on what He has called us to do. See, worship focuses us on who God is. How is worship warfare? Because what Satan so often wants me to doubt is who God is. Isn't that what he does with Adam and Eve? You know why? God doesn't want you to eat the fruit of that tree. God doesn't want you to eat the fruit of that tree because then you'll be like him. And he tries to get Adam and Eve to compromise their view of who God is, but when we come and we worship and we sing these songs and and, and we hear the word of God preached, when we read our Bibles, when we pray, when we're driving to work and we look out at a sunset and we see the majesty of God's creation and we think, This is who God is. It was a reminder that we're not helpless against sin. It's a reminder that God who created us is good and is holy and is righteous. It it turns me away from from assigning bad motives to Him. It turns me away from, from doubting His character. It turns me away from assuming the worst about Him. When we worship and we focus on who God is, we are saying... I don't have to give in to this temptation because the God that is calling me to live this way, the God that's calling me to be a good husband, the God that's calling me to be a good dad, the God that's calling me to act with integrity, He is a good and a righteous God. Worship reminds us of what God has done. So I love, you know, it's just, it's often strange to think about, because, but we're so immersed in it. But if you can just imagine that you never set foot in a church before, you've never heard any songs, any hymns sung in a church before, and you walk into a church and you hear, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. You know what you're going to do? 
you're going to turn around and walk out. That sounds strange. Why in the world are they singing about somebody dying and blood just spilling out all over the place? Because we know what that means and we know what that represents. Because we gather to worship. Because Christ has died for us. Because God values us and loves us and desires a relationship with us so much that he sent his son to die in our place. And when I worship and I remember that God sent his son to die for me, why in the world would I assume that God does not care about how I get through this next week? And if God sent Jesus to die in my place, why would I assume God's just going to leave me be in my problems here and now? Worship focuses us on what God has done, and worship is a recurring display of surrender. I love David when he comes up and he tells Ornan, I need to buy your threshing floor. Ornan says, man, I'll give it to you. And David says, no, I need to pay for it. Why does David insist on paying for it? Because David knows that it's his sin. David knows that, that, that there has to be payment made for his sin. David realizes that he cannot gain from worship, that worship, if it truly is worship, is him surrendering himself. It is that there is no gain. It's not about him. It's not about what he can get. It's not about trying to find shortcuts. It is him submitting completely and totally to God. And when we come into worship, worship defeats and destroys our pride because worship makes us humble. Worship is us crying out to the God of the universe, us hearing from, from God through his word, realizing that, that the reason we have gathered, the, the ability to gather is because of what he has done for us and what he has provided for us. I cannot sing amazing grace and be proud of all that I am and all that I have done. I cannot read God's word and see his goodness, the way that he has revealed himself to us and think that I'm somehow worthy of that. Worship is this continual. Every time I worship, it is a surrender. This is why it's so vital that we don't just worship on Sundays and Wednesdays, but that every day of our life as the people of God, every day of our life we are worshiping God that we are, are taking time to reflect on Him, what He has done and who He is, and praise Him and celebrate Him because every day of my life I need to surrender. And what's amazing is where this all occurs. The threshing floor of Ornan, or if you read it in Kings, it's, his name is given as Aruna. It's on Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah may sound familiar to you because it was on Mount Moriah that God told Abraham to take Isaac. And Isaac was to be brought up to Mount Moriah and sacrificed. Here was the child of promise, the one through whom God said that he would give Abraham a great nation. And he, he tells Abraham to bring Isaac up there and to sacrifice him. And Abraham does this. He puts Isaac on the altar and there in full surrender to God, trusting that God, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, that if God needed to raise Isaac from the dead to fulfill his promise, he would do it. Abraham has the blade raised, and God provides a ram. God provides a substitute. And now, here it is, that the judgment of the Lord is coming, that these people deserve it, and now it sits over the threshing floor of Aruna. And God says, build an altar. I'm providing a substitute. You all don't have to die. There can be a sacrifice instead. And it was there that the temple would be built. And every day, people would come and people would offer sacrifices. There would be sheep and goats and oxen killed. There would be offerings of grain given to God. All as a reminder that we do not have to die because God has provided a substitute. And it would be there. God would not spare judgment when it came for his son. As Jesus is led out of the city of Jerusalem, there to the foot of what was at this time called Mount Moriah, and Christ was crucified. And God 
did not withhold his son from Jesus, that all the wrath of God for the sins of the world, all of your sins and my sins were punished in Christ, that that God's wrath was poured out on him so that you and I would be spared, so that the mercy of God could be given to you and me, the sinners who do not deserve it, but who deserve his full judgment. Jesus bore the wrath of God so we could experience the love of God. And this is what worship begins as I realize that Christ came and Christ lived a sinless life, that he did everything that was necessary. He fulfilled the law perfectly so that I could have a relationship with God. When I understand that, I worship God and all I can do is surrender. I cannot say, God, this is mine. God, this is my opinion. This is what I want from life. When I realize that he has bought my life with the blood of his son, all I can do is get on my face before him and worship him and say, God, how would you have me live? What would you have me do? My life is yours. And when we see that there, God withheld his judgment, God gave us what was necessary to defeat sin. Because here's the thing. All throughout the years, even as people sacrificed at the temple, they kept sinning. They sinned so much, God eventually had to kick them out of the land. He did what he told them he would do up front. The temple was destroyed. And this is when Chronicles is written. Chronicles is written to a people who have no temple, a people who have no home. And it asks them this question. Are you going to trust God? Are you going to trust in the provision? Because what God promised David in chapter 17 is that one would come from him who would sit on the throne forever. See, David was just a temporary king. David, in this event, it only only withheld the judgment of God. But when Jesus came, Jesus withheld the judgment of God. Jesus bore God's judgment so that it doesn't ever have to touch you. You never have to experience separation from the Father by putting your, your trust and your faith in the Son. That you can spend eternity with him. And all you have to do is believe in what Jesus has done by being your substitute, by bearing the sacrifice in your place. And there where judgment and mercy met, God provided for us in Jesus what was necessary for us to defeat the greatest enemy of our life, sin itself. When Jesus died, Jesus didn't stay dead. He conquered sin and he conquered its greatest effect. He conquered death. He rose from the grave and now he sits at the right hand of the Father. And all we have to do is trust in him. And if you're here this morning and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've never trusted in what he has done and you've lived a life plagued by sin, God has provided what is necessary for sin to be defeated in your life. If you're a Christian and you still fight sin, and we all do, you still struggle with sin, God has provided in Jesus what is necessary. He has provided the forgiveness that only Jesus could bring by his death, but Jesus in his death gave us his spirit so that daily we're conformed to the image of Christ and that we're able to fight sin and we're not left helpless and on our own in this battle of temptation. All we need to do is trust in the one who has subdued our enemies. And as we lean on him and depend on him, let him continue to do that. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace to us. We thank you for your kindness in sending Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who in their struggles with sin just feels so helpless feel so impotent that, 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 Father, they would see you have provided what is necessary to defeat sin. You defeated sin in sending Jesus, and all we have to do is put our faith in what he has done. Make him Lord of our life. But, Father, you have given us this gift of worship that enables us to fight sin on a daily basis. And, Father, I pray that we would be a people of worship that our hearts and our affections would consistently and constantly be turned towards you.
that we wouldn't just worship on Sundays and Wednesdays, but that, Father, because every single day of our life is a struggle, every single day of our life we worship. God, help us to trust in you and to honor you with all we have and all we are as we reflect on who you are and what you've done for us. May we surrender to you now. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.